And good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number five of our discussion of the nature of Middle Earth, edited by Carl Hostetter. Uh, great to be back, everybody. Missed you guys last week, um, but uh, ready to dig back into things. <clears throat> yes, Tarloniel, more math today, I promise. Well, mostly. We're not going to do too much math here, I think, but uh, we're definitely going to be discussing some mathematical things uh, for sure. Um, I uh, I just have to say, I find this, um, I'm, I'm pacing myself. I'm, I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to actually be trying to read this book slowly as we go through. I'm not reading too far ahead because it's hard enough for me to keep everything straight without having to remember if this, if uh, the thing I'm remembering is something that's referred to in much later chapters. So I'm trying to restrict myself to reading only at the pace at which we're going, which is, I know, pretty slow. Um, but, uh, man, I, uh, Chapter uh, um, chapter seven is uh, awesome. I mean, I cannot even say how delightful I found uh, I found chapter seven. Um, but um, yeah, you know, Gerald, I have to think that down the road, Tolkien would have loved spreadsheets. I I, I almost wish. You know, Tolkien could have survived to see spreadsheets. Uh, I, I think he'd have loved spreadsheets. I, I really do. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, we will um, uh, we will see. We will see. All right. Anyway, let us. Uh, OK, two quick announcements. First, Baymoot coming up uh, uh, very quickly. So next Saturday, the 6th of November is Baymoot out in Berkeley, California. Um, and uh, we still would love to see uh, more people. There's still plenty of room. So um, uh, you can come join us out in Berkeley if you are in the Bay Area there in Northern California. Uh, look forward to seeing folks there. And then also um, we're going to be doing it digitally as well, right? We have a fully hybrid moot. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know he had spreadsheets on paper, Arthur, but it's not the same, right? Uh, it's not it's not the same. There's 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 not, there's not the same magic involved, right? I just um Sorry, maybe I'm betraying too much of my own affections now. But anyway, please do join us at Baymoot uh, on the 6th, the next weekend. It's going to be awesome. I uh, hope you can tune in for that. Um, also, we are approaching, we are beginning to approach now uh, the deadline for the initial wave of signups for our December space modules. If you're interested in participating in our space program in December, um, registration will be open through the end of November. But if, you know, as I explained in the State of the University address, we are designing our space modules to be totally student driven. Um, we have no agenda for which, uh, which modules get offered in December. Only the ones that you guys choose, that you guys sign up for, that will determine uh, which ones run. Which means if you want to have a hand in determining which modules get run, uh, then you should uh, purchase some tokens between now and the end of next week so that you can be part of that conversation. After that, at the, at the end of next week, on the 7th of November, um, we will set the final schedule for December and determine which modules are definitely going to be running based upon uh, you know, the enrollment we've received so far. You'll still be able to sign up for those, but it will be too late uh, to basically have a say in which modules uh, happen. So don't sit back and wait thinking like, well, I can sign up later on because the module you want might not end up happening in December. We might get pushed back to a different month because we didn't know you wanted to do it because you didn't sign up yet. So uh, so anyway, um, I just wanted to encourage you to think about that. You can go to our uh, page, signumuniversity.org slash space, and you will see the links there for purchasing tokens. You can purchase tokens now and use them whenever. Like, they're good indefinitely. You can give them away. Um, you can gather a couple people together and... You know, you can totally job the system uh, and uh, like get three friends together, buy a three pack at a discount and give them to the other two people. <laughs> like you can totally I don't care. You can totally do that. Uh, we, we we want people to take classes together. I think that'd be fun. Uh, so I have no problem with people doing that uh, anyway. So I uh, just encourage folks to look into that. Our space program is going to be an enormous uh, amount of fun. But um, anyway, uh, 
let us now dig back into the text. You know, Chris, I wonder, Chris is suggesting maybe he would have thought that spreadsheets would be infernal technology more fit for Ted Sandyman than for him. It's possible. He, he might have. But I don't know. I think, you know, I think if he had given, uh, uh, if he had given Excel a shot, uh, he might have really liked it. As I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's get back into the text. So we were uh, in chapter six last time. And um, uh, I wanted to uh, look at, you know, more, more world building. I mean, that's what so far, that's what this um, uh, this book has been entirely about, right? And then we'll get into the mathematical world building uh, that comes after that. So the primary focus of today is the Great Awakening, you know, the Awakening of the Elves and the um, uh, and then the uh, the march, right? The uh, the Great March across uh, the continent. Okay. Remember, he was struggling. The last slide we looked at at the end of last time was the chronological compression, right? When he was looking at the dates that were in the tale of years and he was like, dude, it's not possible, right? It can't work. Um, you know, we've got, you know, in the main action of the Silmarillion, we've got 300 years in which like, you know, humans are supposed to come into being, become corrupted, uh, you know, have like distant descendants who like leave the past behind and migrate across. I mean, like, it's like, no, it's not, uh, uh, it's not going to be, it's not possible for all that to happen in 300 years. Um, nor is it possible for the elves. Remember that his initial dilemma was either because there was very, there was only a small gap between the awakening and the discovery by Orame. And he's like, okay, so either, um, he knew he wanted to have a whole bunch of elves, right? So th it was not an option for Orame to come and find like half a dozen elves uh, there at Quivienne. And he wanted there to be quite a, a tidy throng of them, right? So uh, therefore, the only two choices were either one, um, there had to be a mass awakening, right? Where like thousands of elves all awoke at the same time by the shores of Quivienne, or um, there had to be a bigger gap of time between the awakening and the finding. And of course, the latter he chose. And you'll recall that the reason he didn't choose the former option was that he said it's it's bad mythology, right? So we know he's still thinking in mythic terms, um, but he 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 didn't like that one, right? He he didn't like that entire approach, and he said, no no no, um, we're just going to increase the time now. By having already changed the time scale, right, Valian years to Loar to years of the sun, um, by making that the uh, the 144 to one ratio, he's already accommodated the difficulty with the with that human progression, right? So now instead of um, uh, instead of humans only having 300 years, are going to have a good deal more time, as we'll see. But. Um, uh, Here's his description of the finding now. The finding should evidently be about Valian year 1090, or 90 Valian years after the awakening. So he decided the awakening is going to be right around the year 1000, um, uh, 1000 years of the trees, after the awakening. So that's 12,960 lower. So we've got almost 13,000 years of the sun pass between when the elves awaken by the shores of Quivienne and, and when Orame finally uh, finds them, right? Now, you'll remember this kind of brings back into relief the concern that he had voiced before that, like, man, if we do that, then it's going to have some implications for how the, the readers are going to view the Valar. Right, because they're gonna they're gonna look a little slow on the uptake, right? If it takes them thirteen thousand years to, hey, look, there's elves over there, right? Um, but remember, he was like, yeah, maybe that's no bad thing, right? You know, if they, sort of, if the you know readers kind of perceive the fallibility uh, of the elf of the Valar, sorry, in this way, okay. This would give them time, even at elvish rates, for multiplication from small beginnings. Also, which is important time to invent the beginnings of the primitive Quendian language, to discover something about Arda and of their own powers and talents. These are some really important things here, right? Let's start with the latter points first. If they are still basically kind of blinking in the sunlight when Orame shows up to them, it puts them in a much more 
a sort of infantile relationship, right? Um, he does. So again, mythically speaking, thinking about the kind of story that he's writing and how this myth is supposed to work. What he does not want is for Orome uh, to come to, you know, a group of creatures who have just woken up, don't know anything about the world, right? Are just kind of looking around in wide eyed innocence, staring at their own extremities and wondering how they work, right? He, that's not what he wants. Um, he wants to give them time to become themselves sophisticated, right? To build their own culture on their own terms, uh, to, you know, begin to uh, establish themselves in Arda and after they've established themselves so that they already have their own culture. They already have their own abilities, um, you know, kind of developed and worked out when Orime finds them. That puts them not exactly on a peer relationship. They're not peers, right? I mean, that's just, they're not peers, but, but they're closer to peers, right? Um, it's more like a big sibling, little sibling relationship than, you know, Orime coming up to them and, and treating them like they're toddlers, right? Okay, hold my hand and come with me and we'll teach you how to write. Like, it's not what he wanted. Now, in addition, of course, we have the language business. And if this doesn't make you smile uh, with, um, you know, great affection towards uh, Tolkien and his ways, I don't know what will, right? I mean, what a marvelously Tolkienian paragraph this is. What a, what a delightful and totally un, uh, totally expected right uh, vista into Tolkien's attitude towards language and language invention uh, th it is most important that they should have the opportunity to invent the beginnings of the primitive Quendian language now those of you uh, uh, as we might say uh, you know uh, I'm thinking of the line, you know, uh, Brie memories being retentive. Um, those of you whose memories are retentive, like the Brie Lander's memories, uh, will recall that one of the things that he had originally been contemplating before was that Orame would come and teach them language. Right. I mean, so there was the there was the valley. And so that he had the idea that the elves language was derivative from the language of the Valar. Right. And it was part that was part of the 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 uh, the I almost said the Klamath, which is just not the right thing. The Klamas, uh, the Tree of Tongues, um, which he was developing back the last time he thought he was going to get to publish the Silmarillion. Right. Which was in 1937, right after The Hobbit was released. Um, so. Um, so, yeah, so he um, is. Completely. He's turned around on that. Right. And he now thinks it's very important that the elves should invent their own language. And as we're going to see, he doubles down on this uh, pretty significantly. Uh, sorry, just a brief pause for those of you who are attending uh, the uh, Zoom. I can see your questions, which is great. Um, but uh, the for the visuals, you should go to twitch.tv slash Signum U or you should go to the Signum YouTube channel and you'll be able to see the slides uh, there. OK, um, so, right. Oh, let's keep going. Language, we must suppose, was a specifically elvish gift, not possessed by the Valar even, until they found the Quendi. Not possessed by the Valar even, until they found the Quendi. So he reverses it. No, 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 no. It's the Quendi, right? That is the people who speak with tongues. Uh, it is the Quendi who are going to teach language to Orme, right? I mean... Mind blown, right? Mind blown. A gift of Eru inherent in their nature, so that from their awakening, they immediately began to try to communicate in speech with one another. Men had a similar gift, but less marked and less skilled, as they were less skilled in all artistic matter, language being the primary art, right? And oh my goodness, like there's another just awesome Tolkien line, right? Um, uh, doesn't that sound like um, one of Tolkien's uh, like personal mottos or something like that? Right. Um, language is the primary art. Uh, I can totally imagine like if if Tolkien had had a car, he would have put that on a, uh, as a bumper sticker on his car. Right. Um, I know he had a car at one point briefly and wrecked it a bunch of times like Mr. Bliss, um, but it was brief and they got rid of it. Not or not around long enough to have a bumper sticker. Maybe he'd put that sticker on his bicycle or something. I don't know. Um, 
Chris, that is a good Signum merch idea. Language is the primary art. Yeah. Yeah, note to self. Okay, well, I'm not actually making a note. I'm just saying note to self, which really just uh, like kind of um, makes it. Chris, could you email that to me so I don't forget? I don't have time to write a note. Um, but thank you for somebody reminding me there. Um, <laughs> anyway, language is the primary art. Hence, their ruder tongues, that is humans, their ruder tongues were much improved by contact later with Quindy. And the general similarity, apart from loan words, of Western speeches of men with Quindian. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, awesome, right? I, and again, notice how this, um, one of the things, when I think about the shift from the Lamas before, right, his older conception, which was that Orome comes and like the first thing he does is teach them language, right? Um, that shift to this, <clears throat> there are several things, right? One is, again, that shift in relative status between the elves and the Valar, right? This makes it even clearer that there's this um, big sibling, little sibling thing going on. There's no question the Valar are the big siblings still, right? I mean, they are much more powerful than the elves, but, um, but the elves have something to offer. The elves have something that they don't. Even notice a gift of Eru inherent in their nature, right? That is, they have a gift from Eru that the Valar do not have, right? Um, which is cool, perfectly, um, perfectly fair, right? Um, but notice a reminder that they're all children of Iluvatar, right? Uh, the Valar and the uh, elves alike are, you know, the offspring of Iluvatar. Uh, and he has given them, although he gave the Valar greater gifts of, 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 of might and stature and power, uh, he gave different gifts to the Quendi, right? Um, and he made them lesser. Lesser in power, lesser in influence, but uh, but they are all his children. So, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, I don't want to say levels the playing field. That's not exactly right. But you see what I mean? It puts them in a fundamentally different relationship. Um, and uh, I, the way in which it has, we did not necessarily see, I think, in the old system, Anyway, and by the old system, I primarily mean even um, the published Silmarillion, right? We don't really see many ways in which the elves themselves, the elves themselves change the Valar. Like, how do the Valar adapt themselves? Like, you know, look at the Valar before and after their interactions with the elves and say, like, what did they learn? What did they gain from, I mean, the opportunity to, you know, uh, you know, love them and, and, you know, I'm sure they've been improved in some kind of abstract ways, but there was nothing like that they, that they learned, you know, that they took from them. And here there is, right? This whole speech thing, this whole language business, kind of fun, right? Um, and the idea that the elves, they're not just good at languages, like they literally invented language. Like it was, that was their idea. The Valar didn't come up with that. Um, yeah, so that is uh, really cool. So, Gerald, yes, the idea there is that the Valar started as mimes. No, not as mimes, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, they're spiritual beings, right? They don't need to... They, they certainly don't need to... Um, make mouths and tongues and lips for themselves in order to shape physical air into particular sound patterns in order to convey their thought from one to another, right? I mean, bodies are not native to them. So obviously that mode, like the mode of the, the concept of communicating through spoken words would be alien to them. Of course it would, right? Again, when you look at it, um, it is, um, it is, sort of quite natural, right? One realizes um, that they would have other um, uh, other opportunities. Now, Stephen, you raise an excellent question. So then did Aule not have a language to teach his dwarves? As of course, this was always a big thing, right? There were, there were kind of, th there were the three different roots of um, languages in the Hlamas, right? If I'm remembering all three of them, right? There was the Valian language that Orome taught. Uh, there was the dwarves' language, which Aule invented himself and taught to the dwarves. And of course, then there was a language that Melkor invented for his creatures. Um, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Now, Bruce is wondering if primary in languages, the primary art, means first or most important. Um, yes. <laughs> I think I think some of both. I think first, but there's no question the I think there's no question of the assertion of importance that he's making in context there. Um they were skilled in all artistic matter, language being the primary art. It's possible to interpret that as like their primary art, like of all the arts that the elves pursued, language was their primary art. It's possible to read the sentence that way, I think. And and imagine that that's what he's attempting to convey, that um, it is the um, like the one art that all elves share above all others. Right. It's possible. Um, but it kind of sounds like he is expressing an absolutely shameless philological bias and saying language Language is the the primary, the essential art. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Chris, I agree that it does put the. One thing that this sort of, there are two lines from the Aino Lindale, Chris, that your comment and this passage were making me think of. First, uh, Chris, you're talking about the music, right? And thinking about um, the, if you think about them, the Valar not having any language, it really does inform how you think about the music, right? Now, this reminds me that um, although the Silmar, the, the Aino Lindale states quite clearly that the music that is made by the Ainur, that their song is like unto the music of viols and harps and, you know, and, and, and all that kind of thing. And it's not just an acapella choir, right? That's not what it would have sounded like. And yet, that's what I always picture, right? I, I find... Uh, Chris, that my imagination has not followed, although my brain has followed the text, my imagination has not, right? And I tend, when I imagine the music of the Ainur, I almost always imagine them all just singing um, uh, with words or at least just tonally singing, right? Um, uh, you know, perhaps in some kind of chant, and, and, and but I always picture that. I don't actually picture... You know, like a Vala opening his mouth and the sound of like a harpsichord coming out or something like I, I, I don't picture that. But probably um, we probably should uh, in uh, in some sense or other. Um, the second passage that I'm reminded of is the one th where we're told the Valar's the, the reaction of the <clears throat> of the Ainur to the revelation that there would be children, right? The children of Iluvatar. <clears throat> and that in the children of Iluvatar, they would come to like understand Iluvatar himself in new ways. That there would be new things that they would see. They'd be like themselves and yet different. And in them they would, you know, discover new wonders about the nature of Iluvatar that they didn't know before. Um but I never knew what that might be like or any sort of concrete examples of that exactly, right? Um, and yet here we have one, right? He's giving us a very plain example right up front. Um, so that's um, kind of um, kind of fun. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. The Quendi never fell in the sense that men did. Being tainted with the shadow, as perhaps even the Valar in some degree were, with all things in Ardamard, they could do wrong. But they never rejected Eru, or worshipped Melkor or Sauron, either individually or in groups or as a whole people. Their lives, therefore, came under no general curse or diminishment, and their lifespan, coextensive with the remainder of the life of Arda, was unaltered, except only insofar as, with the very aging of Arda itself, their primitive vigor of body steadily waned. But the waning does not yet appreciably affect the periods dealt with in the Silmarillion. 
Okay. Um, so <clears throat> here, of course, I gave us this passage because uh, we've been talking about this whole fallenness thing, and here he alludes to it explicitly by name. And not only does he use the word fall in conjunction with men, right, um, and therefore clearly evoke the idea of the fall of man, of, you know, the... the, the um, the fall of man as articulated through the Christian tradition built on interpretations of the book of Genesis, right? He's clearly evoking, explicitly evoking that in the first sentence. Um, he's implicitly invoking that uh, elsewhere in the passage, um, specifically when he says, their lives therefore came under no general curse or diminishment, and their lifespan, coextensive with the remainder of the life of Arda, was unaltered. Right. He mentions these things because these are the things that he expects people to associate with the concept of fallenness because of that, uh, because of the Catholic tradition. Right. So we've got um, first their lives came under no general curse, as was understood to have happened in Genesis chapter three. Right. Mankind as a whole came under a general curse and diminishment of their lives and even of their lifespan over time. Right. That is, Adam lived for a really long time, as did his immediate descendants. But later on down the road, people don't live that long anymore. So even within the context of the biblical accounts, we see this idea of the diminishment uh, of the the um, lifespan. Right. So he's explicitly saying these things that you might associate with fallenness. Right. Don't apply to the elves. They're under no general curse. Their lifespan is unaltered. Um, but so they did not fall in the sense that men did. Notice also what he associates with that fall, right? They never rejected Eru or worshipped Melkor or Sauron, either individually or in groups or as a whole people, right? So um, they could go wrong, but not that far wrong, right? They never went so far as to actually openly rebel against Iluvatar, to reject Eru himself and or worship Melkor or Sauron, right? The elves did not do this, um, which again shows you that what some of the things that he is associating with the fall of man, that fallen man often has done both of those things, reject God and uh, worship false gods, right? Um, uh, much of the drama of the Old Testament involves both of those things. That is the rejection of God and the worshiping of false gods. Um, so he says, this is not, um, um, this is not, this is not their issue, right? Now, Arthur, of course, that is an excellent point about the prophecy of the North, right? About the doom of the Noldor and such. That sounds like a general curse, right? That is laid upon them. Um, no, that's a specific curse, that's laid upon those elves, right? Um, but even those elves, even the Noldor, were not guilty of either rejecting Eru or worshiping Melkor, right? They didn't. That's that's not what they did, and that's not. And the curse is not a curse on all of Elvendom in the way that the curse fell upon all humanity through Adam and Eve, again, according to Catholic tradition. So, um, so it's different. Specific curse, that is. Not a general curse. Um, uh, yeah, Stephen is saying, does this mean that those who claim that orcs came from elves lie with the tongue of Melkor? Kind of sounding that way, isn't it, Stephen? I have to admit that was the very first thing that I thought of um, when I uh, read that sentence, but they never rejected either individually or in groups or as a whole people. I'm like, really? Never? None of them? None of them did. Not a single individual elf ever worshipped Melkor or Sauron, huh? All right. So uh, there's your orc answer. Stephen, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Um, now, yeah. Now, Arthur, yes, they rejected the Valar. Um, that is not the same thing as rejecting. Yes, they were rejecting the delegated authorities appointed by Iluvatar. Yes, not the same thing. Not the same thing. Um, but... Um, yeah, a good. Exactly. As Mary points out, notice how even Feanor is swearing to Eru. 
Um, so even the oath of Feanor itself is premised upon a respect for Eru, right? Uh, certainly a non-rejection of Eru. It still holds him as the arbiter, right, of things, um, calling him in witness uh, of his uh, of his vow. <clears throat> I'm not saying that's a good idea. I'm just saying it shows that he's not simply rejected uh, Eru. So, Mary, I agree with you. I think it's a really, really good point. Um, but, um, okay, so, um, yeah, so... Christopher, I agree that the idea of the quickening of aging, um, you know, the, 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 the increased rapidity of change in the world with the rising of the sun and moon must have gone beside the board since the sun and moon have been there from the beginning, right? So the, that is, it's not a thing anymore, right? We're not introducing the sun. The sun's always been there. Um, so uh, even the... Notice, Chris, the words that he's using here with the very aging of Arda itself, their primitive vigor of body steadily waned. Um, the very aging of Arda itself and then the ad the adverb steadily, right, uh, being connected with that suggests to me that he is, in fact, um, abandoning the idea of that increase in the uh, uh, rapidity of change under the sun. Um you know, or that, I mean, obviously it can't any longer be the sun, but he could conceivably think of some other milestone, right, that would indicate it. And maybe he still will, but um, but uh, but it sounds like he's abandoned that, that. Now, Chris, to follow up with that, one of the things that I would wonder, uh, one of the things that I would wonder is, does he, um, has he abandoned also the idea that the air of Middle-earth affects the Eldar differently? than the era of Valinor. That I doubt he has, actually, but maybe we'll see. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Stephen, uh, thinking about the curse of Feanor, and, or the oath of Feanor and such, says it kind of reminds him of Job, who's upset with God and questioning God, but never rejecting him or cursing him. Yeah, yeah. Um, um yeah, exactly. Now, Tarlonia, we did discuss some of the elves being seduced to the dark side in our last session. Yes, I remember that too. So I don't know uh, if this means he's taking that back or if he's just waffling about the whole orc question again. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, Cause yeah, exactly. It's in this, it's in this same, it's in the same chapter. I know. I know. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, clearly on the one hand, the main thing that he's saying here is that they're fallen in a sense, but it's because again, like not only as we've discussed, do people have, you know, do people kind of incorporate, um, certain things with the idea of fallenness, um, things like the general curse and the diminishment and, and uh, the diminishment of lifespan and that kind of thing. Um, but also they have likewise associations with unfallen, right? So if you say that the Quendi are unfallen, a lot of people are going to assume that that must mean that they like have an inability to sin. Like they just, they never, they're never tempted by evil and they never do anything wrong. And so he's, He's emphasizing neither of those paradigms function here, right? Um, the elves are in a different state, which is not one which maps clearly into the Catholic tradition of the history of mankind, right? They are not fallen in the sense that men are fallen. They came under no general curse or diminishment of their lifespan. But they also are fallen. They're not perfect, they are fought. They can do wrong and often do do wrong, but they never rejected arrow. Um, yeah. So, um, how do we explain the contradiction? I don't know. Other than saying he's brainstorming here, right? Let's not forget that he's brainstorming. Uh, and we'll, s and let's just see, let's see where things settle out. And if he comes back to this. Okay. Now, another issue that he wanted to resolve was the Angband plan, right? 
Um, I wasn't myself super troubled about this, but uh, it's fun to see him work this out. Okay, this is the probable story, and I love it anytime Tolkien draws a pointy finger uh, in the margin pointing at something. I think that's uh, super fun. This is the probable story, pointing finger. As soon as he discovered the Quendi, if not indeed far sooner, and well before the time of their awakening, which Melkor guessed more shrewdly than the Valar, Melkor constructed Angband. One of its chief functions was not only to defend the western shores, but to shroud them. The prime function of, originally volcanic, Thangorodrim, was to produce smokes, vapors, and darkness. All the northwestern shores were covered, and the sun largely excluded for hundreds of years before Melkor was made captive. Sauron had a chief part in this, and when the Valar at last came to Middle-earth, he, under Melkor's orders, made a strong feint of resistance while Melkor retreated and gathered nearly all his forces in Utumno. Thus, passage of the Quendi was made feasible because of that gathering together, right? Since Melkor has forded up in Utumno, and therefore he's pulled in all of his wandering monsters and everybody, right? Uh, his roving threats, uh, he's, uh, and he's stored them up in Utumno for the defense. Therefore, you know, the, uh, the, the migration uh, of the elves is, uh, is going to be, uh, is going to be okay, generally. Okay. Um, Anyway, let's keep going. Angband was in the event largely destroyed, though the Valar, passing on to Utumno, which was apparently the real center of Melkor's power, made no attempt to demolish it completely. But when Melkor feigned submission to Manwe, Sauron was ordered to reconstruct it as secretly as possible, therefore largely in extending its underground mansions, against Melkor's escape and return. There were no more fumes until Melkor returned, but when he did in 1495, Angband was almost ready. Melkor then made it his chief seat of power, for strategic reasons, and because of the coming of the Eldar. Had he been successful, he would perhaps have returned to Utumno, but not until the Eldar were vanquished or destroyed. Okay, um, this is pretty awesome, actually. Like, I love this story. Um... Uh, a few things that I would emphasize about this. Note, note a couple things that we can see happening here. First, note the alteration that he's making to Melkor's character. Melkor, Melkor is playing the long game here, right? He is anticipating the attack of the Valar and anticipating its success as well. His submission to Manwe is something he's got planned out long in advance. Not that he thinks, I, perhaps, he doesn't think it's inevitable, but he certainly at least thinks it likely. It's anyway his plan B. Presumably plan A is to beat down the Valar when they attack Otumno, but failing plan A, he's got plan B ready to go. And plan B is to feign submission and sucker that Manway chump into taking him prisoner, holding him for a while, and then probably having mercy on him. Sucker, right? And because eventually this is going to happen and he's going to get free. And when he gets free, so he's had his lackey there paving the way the whole time, right? Pretty awesome. Now, Chad, you're right. Too many stories have bad guys not thinking ahead. Yeah, Melkor totally thinking ahead here. Absolutely. And notice Sauron's role in this. What's Sauron's job? Chief Volcano Minder. Right? That's his job. Who do you put in charge of the volcano? You put Sauron in charge of the volcano, right? And his job is to produce smokes, vapors, and darkness. Full-time air pollution is his job, right? Um, so what... It, it's, it's perfect, right? It's perfect. Um, it's perfect. It perfectly maps onto what we see. Notice how, by doing this, he, um, he puts this... Uh, He's able to cast a kind of retroactive, uh, uh, add a level of depth to the Lord of the Rings itself, right? When the dawnless day comes over Gondor, if we know this ancient lore, right, um, we see Sauron is back to his old game that he learned under Melkor ages and ages ago, right? Um, the 
blocking out of the sun, the creating, like, I don't care what you do with your sun. Um, you know, sure, there might be light and high uh, beauty that the shadow cannot touch, but down here on middle, I can control things down here, and I could cover everything with shadow. Um, but, um, but more, more. Even remember the references to um, uh, the desolation, right? The uh, mountains vomiting the filth of their entrails and all that kind of thing, right? That was Sauron's original day job, right? You know, so like, um, you know, early Sauron, when he was still in his internship, uh, this is what he did, right? He controlled volcanoes and he churned out filth um, uh, in order to, uh, you know, chiefly, of course, smokes, vapors, and darkness, but um, but these were volcanoes, right? Um, I bet you that the area around, around Thangorodrim was also uh, uh, mounded high with uh, the entrails of the mountains, right? Um, anyway, so it's just the way in which this passage enables us kind of retroactively to see um, not only to perceive when you know, when we get to Mordor, right? Uh, this sense of like, uh, oh, how horrible this is and what it what does it reveal about Sauron's character? Um, but even more than that, it brings us to think something along the lines of he's at it again, right? It just sort of shows us this sort of closed loop that he is... Um, uh, that he is on. Um, yeah, yeah. Arthur is now picturing him, imagining Sauron's internship and picturing him on call wearing scrubs and carrying a pager. Yeah, I do think that medical internship uh, uh, would have been... I, I, Well, Arthur, I mean, I, I think that that is modeled uh, after uh, Melkor's internship plan, for sure. Um, I I remember that well enough um, to, <laughs> to, to think that likely. Um yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, Chris uh, Chris says this makes Sauron an Arpharazon recapitulation on a smaller scale. Um, uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet we, we see, right, yeah, we see him, we see very similar patterns there. Um, yes. And then, of course, we get the reason why Melkor set up at Angband instead of returning to Utumno, which I'd coined, kind of always idly wondered about. Um, why didn't he just go back to Utumno? Because especially since we're told that they did not destroy all of Utumno, the Valar didn't. Um, uh, right, for strategic reasons, right? Because he was focused on the Eldar and he wanted to destroy them. Pretty cool stuff. All right. What about men? We've got to fix that. Um, we've got to fix that uh, uh, problem with that 300 year problem, which just won't do. Right. OK. Um, if, as in the tale of years, the Valar came forth in Valiant year 1090 and Utumno was besieged in 1092 and destroyed in 1100, then men must awake before Valiant year 1090. If they awoke in Valiant year 1050, that would give 40 Valiant years, or 5,760 sun years, in which Melkor could have dealings with them and corrupt them before his captivity. Because this is the problem we have, right? We can't, there's no way we can have the sun rising after Melkor's incarceration, right? Or, like, very soon after Melkor's um, uh I mean, like, Melkor needs to be there, right? We need Melkor to be a free agent when humans come on the scene. Now, originally this was accomplished by having that happen much later. Well, I say much later. A few years later, right? Uh, a few hundred years later. But in any case, it was after he was released from prison, right? That's according to the original time frame, right? Now he says, okay, I want to push back the awakening of men to make it earlier than I had made it before. Because now, of course, there is no sun rising for the first time thing going on. So there's no point. And it doesn't matter. We can make it as early as we want just after the elves. Um, so 
But of course, now you've got the whole time of Melkor's captivity. We can't have men showing up. So they still got to show up either after the captivity or before. Since after is too late, we've got to go before. So he's, he is now logically the, the threat of his narrative which he's not changing the big narrative, right? You know, the awakening of the elves, the uh, bringing of the ambassadors, the migration of the elves, the attack on uh, the imprisonment, you know, the chaining of Melkor, and then the release of Melkor, and the unrest of the Noldor, all, all that stuff, right? He, he's not, he doesn't seem to be questioning any of those made that major sequence. So we've got to push the awakening of men back to before Melkor's imprisonment, and this will do it, right? Valiant year 1050 will do it. It would give them 40 Valiant years, 5,760 sun years, in which Melkor could have dealings with them and corrupt them before his captivity. Plenty of time to bring about the fall of man. Right, okay. The Atani entered Beleriand in 310, uh, uh, in, in 310, uh, the year 310 of Beleriand. That is in the 22nd sun year of Valiant year 1498. Men had then existed for 448 Valian years plus 22 sun years, i.e. 64,534 sun years, which, though doubtless insufficient scientifically, since that's only we begin, uh, since that is only we being in 1960 of the seventh age, 16,000 years ago, total about 80,000, is inadequate, is adequate for purposes of the Silmarillion, etc. Okay, so you can see... The second biggest deal on this slide is that he's placing them much, much earlier, right? So they're still the aftercomers, uh, but they are, uh, as I've said in my slide title here, the soon thereafter comers, right? Uh, because there's uh, now only a small gap, right? We're looking at a 50 valiant year gap between the coming of the elves and the coming of men. Um, so they might be the aftercomers, but they're right on their heels, um, the elves are still multiplying, right? Uh, Orme has not even found them yet before the humans appear too, right? Um, so uh, Melkor, of course, is therefore two for two in finding the... Not only does, does he find both of the children before the Valar find either one of them, you know, each of them, but he finds both of them before the Valar find even one of them. Right? They've not even discovered the elves yet before Melkor already knows them both and has already brought about the corruption of humans. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, several of you are asking, are wondering about the dwarves, just as uh, Stephen was wondering about the Aule creating the dwarves' language and teaching it to them. Um, we're not talking about dwarves. <laughs> uh, Tolkien has not evinced the single, and uh, we're going to get to that, I think. But um, uh, at least I certainly doubt that Tolkien has forgotten it, right? But he is not, um, right now, he's focused, focused on the elves and the men. Okay, so the humans have been around for a long time. They've been around for 64,534 years of the sun before they enter Beleriand. That's a lot better than 310 years, right? Which is what it was before. Um, so instead of them having to awaken, multiply, become corrupted, right? Fall, right? Experience the fall of man, develop corrupt societies, have some secede from those corrupt societies, leave those behind and wander far away, leaving their traditional past behind them until eventually they make their way into Beleriand, which is like more or less the backstory of the house of Beor. Um, Remember, he was saying, like, that cannot happen in 310 years, right? That's not okay at all, right? Now, 64,500 years? All right. Okay, now we're talking. That feels reasonable. He says it's doubtless insufficient scientifically. That is to say, it doesn't actually map on to the fossil record or anything, but he can live with it. He can live with it. Now, of course, the... Um, uh, <laughs> it's 
sorry. I just saw Tomas was saying, in Valiant Year 1066, all the forces of Utumno occupied Beleriand and ruined forever the beautiful original speech of the Quendi. Um, it's a Battle of Hastings joke, but um, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Tomas. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, okay. Um, I said that was the second biggest deal on this slide. You saw the biggest deal, right? We being in 1960 of the Seventh Age. So that the year 310... The year 310 in Beleriand was 16,000 years ago. We've got a date. We've got a date. We being in 1960 of the Seventh Age. So the Seventh Age of Middle Earth began at the time of Christ, right? Okay. Do we know the definition of like when the fourth and fifth ages ended? We know when the sixth age ended, apparently. And by the way, I would have to think it's a little bit awkward in some ways. Because if the pattern holds, shouldn't the sixth age have ended not with the birth of Christ, but with the crucifixion or perhaps with the resurrection? Right? All the other ages, first age, Second Age, Third Age, all end with the defeat of evil, right? Um, that's always the trend. I mean, three for three on that, right, with the first three ages. Um, so uh, I would have thought, as I said. But anyway, maybe his hands are tied on that one. Um so you guys will remember, indeed, you were reminding me several weeks ago um, that when we were discussing Morgoth's ring, I was uh, uh, posthumously urging Tolkien. Well, I wasn't urging posthumously, but I was urging to posthumous Tolkien um, uh, to um, I'm not trying to break any news and say that I actually died several years ago or anything. Um, no. Uh, but anyway, I was saying to posthumous Tolkien to let it go. Right. To just cut the cord between his imagined world and our real world. Right. And what do we see? The absolute refusal <laughs> of that. He's going in the opposite direction, if anything. Instead of waving his hands like he does in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, waving his hand at the like this stuff all happened a long, long time ago. Right. It's our world, but it's our world remotely in time, right? No longer remote, right? Um, now, I mean, okay, 16,000 years is still reasonably remote, um, but it's no longer uh, indeterminately remote, right? Um, there's, um, there's a very specific timing that's given. Here we are in... 1960 of the Seventh Age. Um, so there you are. Okay. So let's work out the timeline here a little bit more. Quendi awake, Valiant Year 1000. Men awake, Valiant Year 1075. Okay, so we've altered it a little bit. And are hidden from other contacts by Melkor. But Eru, independently of Manway, sends messages and messengers to them, that is to men, and the elves. That is about 10,800 sun years after the elves awoke, and 15 valiant years, or 2,160 sun years, before the attack of the Valar. The Valar do not discover men whose center was far south of Utumno, and think the removal of Melkor probably sufficient protection. They are not supposed to meddle with men, but only guard them so that they can develop as they should. But they are anxious, especially after they discover that Melkor had already affected the Quendi, and are aware that by no means all of Melkor's evil associates and forces had been destroyed or captured. They are therefore always sending out emissaries and explorers to Middle-earth during the captivity of Melkor. Okay, so... There's a a, a 2,160-year now, since he's compressed it, he's moved it up, bumped it up from like 1050 up to 1075, now the Awakening of Men. 
Um, I don't know. Do, do we think maybe they got too close together, right? He wanted to, there to be a little bit more distance between the first comers and the second comers, right? I don't know. But in any case, he says, all right, 1075, that means we've got 15 years. 1090 is the date of the war, right? So that still gives them 2,000, a little over 2,000 years uh, in order for Melkor to corrupt them. Uh, whereas the elves will have been around for 10,000 years. Okay, no problem. Um, notice the things that he says. Um, notice the things that he says. Um, about the relationship between Eru and the children. That Eru sends messages and messengers to them, independently of Manwe. So we have Eru acting independently of the Valar to communicate with both the men and the elves. Also, we have a clearer set of marching orders being given to the Valar about men. They are not supposed to meddle with men, but only guard them so that they can develop as they should. When, um, when is this rule passed, do you think? I can't help but think it's pretty conspicuous, right? Um, pretty conspicuous. Thinking about the, um, the elves, right? In other words, they get a directive is that essentially says, okay, whatever you do, don't do to the humans what you did to the elves. Thank you very much. Right? I mean, it couldn't be more explicit. Don't meddle. Just guard them. Let them develop on their own, as they should, this time. <sighs> I mean, it almost doesn't it sound like that. I mean, we're not told that Manwe gets this memo from, from Eru after they invite the elves back to Valar, Right? Back to Valinor, sorry. So that the Valar received this memo from Iluvatar saying, <sighs> all right, guys, now, um, this time, don't do it. You'd, th I mean, we don't know anything about the timing of this. Now, again, I know they've not, when men are awake, they still haven't, the Orome still hasn't discovered the Quendi yet, right? So the Eldar are still not even discovered by the Valar at this time. And yet it seems to be referring to well after this, right? After the removal of Melkor, when they're making the decision to say, okay, it's fine. We don't need to go looking for them, right? We don't need to go, well, I don't need to send Orame out to try to find the humans. Um, uh, I don't need to send Orame out to try to find the humans because um, they're, um, they're fine. We've removed Melkor, so they should be, they should be in pretty good shape, right? but that they are not supposed to meddle with them. If, um, if they are... Either way, frankly, it's conspicuous, right? If they get that memo from Iluvatar after the invitation of the elves, then it seems pretty pointed. Okay, guys, great. Yeah, that's great. Don't do that again, please. Right. I mean, how else can I can you read that if it comes after? Right. But if it comes before, it's just as pointed. Right. OK, Manway, do not meddle with men. Let them develop as they should. And so what the Val are like, ah, but he didn't say we couldn't meddle with the elves and that we had to let them develop as they should. Let's meddle with the elves and make them develop in a totally different way. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? He totally didn't say we couldn't do that, right? So it's like one way or another, if they've actually received directives, whether it's before or after their interactions with elves, it's pretty, um, it's, pre it's pretty conspicuous, right? Uh, I cannot help but think. 
Um, in other words, he seems to be making the bad choice of the... He seems to be making it clearer and clearer that the invitation of the Valar is a very bad choice. Um, and that... Uh, and, and if it's... Because, I mean, if it's true, if they have that as a sort of injunction from Iluvatar, it's hard to get around. Um it's 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 hard to get around with it, uh, to to get to get around the idea that it's that it was a bad idea. Um, Tomas says, "Does this mean the Quendi are the first failed experiment of Eru, while the men are the perfected vision of the children?" Well, that's going, I think, way further than this would en enable us to go. But, um, um, but do the Valar learn from their mistakes the first time? Yeah, perhaps so. Perhaps so. Um, yeah, perhaps so. If we take Valiant Year 1000 as the probable date of the awakening and 1085 as a, of the finding by, by Orome, 1090, beginning of the assault of the Valar, 1102, Ingwe, Finwe, and Elwe brought to Valinor. So now here's here. Now we have the ambassadors. 1105, beginning of the Great March. 1115, separation of the Nandor. 1125, Eldar reached Beleriand. 1130, Thingol lost. 1133, Vanyar and Noldor land in Amman. Then we must consider the matter of the Eldar and the ages and position of Ingwe, etc. In 1085, Orome found already a considerable people who had already had dealings with emissaries of Melkor. So he's content with the framework now. That is, he is satisfied that these, that those starting from those first dates, right, a thousand as the probable date of the awakening, 1085 is the finding. 1090 is the beginning of the assault on the Valar. Those are the dates we've seen him tweaking, right? And trying to figure out, is this enough time for us to have the mythic situation that he wants? That is a numerous, autonomous, developed, linguistic people, right? Um, okay, plenty of time. That, you know, that, um, that 85 Valian years, which translates to tens of thousands of years, Oh, well, about 10,000 years or so, uh, years of the sun. Okay, sure, that's enough time. So now we see him extend it forward, right? So let's continue the, let's continue the narrative and notice the narrative is unchanged. There, that's still the outline of the narrative that we are familiar with from the old story, right? We've got the ambassadors, we've got the Great March, we've got the separation of the Nandor, we've got uh, the reaching of Beleriand, we've got Thingol and Melian, right? And then we've got the Vanyar and Noldor, but not yet the Teleri arriving in Amon, right? Okay, so we've got the outline that we're familiar with, and he's able to assign dates to those, right, based upon the framework that he's established. So, okay, all right, we've got a new timeline now. Now it's time to roll up our sleeves and see what this really looks like, right? Let's get down in the weeds. No more tale of years stuff, right? No mere annals. No, 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 no. Let's actually, um, let's actually dig in. So we get to chapter seven, which as I've said, I absolutely love. Okay, um, I'm just going to read. Mapping the March. The dates for the March, etc., given in the Tale of Years, are devised to fit the scale 10 lower equals 1 valiant year. Of course, the old time frame that he's rejected. But even so are too long? The Eldar take 20 valiant years equals 200 sun years to reach Beleriand. But we must imagine many long halts and waverings. Also, the Eldar still desired children, and no doubt begot many on the March but they would halt for this purpose. Halts would occupy at least 10 sun years gestation, nine plus mother's rest, plus 10 growth years, which is 120 sun years. Remember, you got the growth years and the aging years, right? So for the, those, first, um, those first 10 years, they're growing fast, right? So they're not, the elves are not going to 
start migrating again until the kids are 10 growth years. So in other words, from when they stop to make with the begetting until they're ready to pack up the kids and go is going to be a 130 sun year period of time. So whenever we talk about them halting to have kids, that's 130 years. We're dropping 130 years there, right? Minimum. We got to drop 130 years for the youngest children to grow to marching age. They would then march on during an interval of about 30 sun years and halt 130 again. Let us say the march began in Valian year 1110, when the total number of Quendi was about 15,000. Suppose 10,000 marched Eldar and 5,000 Avari remained. Ingar, 1,000. Noldor, 3,500. Teleri, 5,500. Ladar, Lindar, Sindar, Nandor. Time out. You're asking, who the heck are the Ingar? Right? Oh, well, the Ingar are the Vanyar. It's just he's changing their name again from, Ing from Vanyar to Ingar. And if you're asking me, why is he doing this? I would ask you, are you surprised that he's doing this? Right? I mean, how many times has he changed the names of the elves over, you know, since the beginning, right? Since the Book of Lost Tales. Tons of times, right? So we just have to, like, keep rolling with it, man. Just keep rolling with it. Apparently, the Vanyar and now the Ingar. So we've got to deal. That's our job is to deal with it. Okay, fine. The Ingar. Noldor and Teleri. So he's assigning proportions here. Distance? Beleriand was about 550 miles broad from Eglares to the mountains of Loon, from the mountains of Loon to the Sea of Hrun. <laughs> well, that sounds very similar when I read it aloud, doesn't it? Uh, is, according to the Lord of the Rings map, over 1,250 miles. Total, 1,750 miles. How far east or southeast of the Sea of Hrun was Quivienen? If we say in ancient days that Quivienen was 2,000 miles as the crow flies from the coast of ancient Beleriand, this will be approximately right. Okay, so, first of all, notice he is still brainstorming here. He is still... Um, he is still thinking in vague and general terms here. This is him trying to wrap his head around in broad terms what the march would have been like, right? Um, his calculation there of the halts, for instance, right? Notice him thinking this through, right? We must imagine many long halts and waverings. Um, they still desired children, Right. So, OK, so we have so when we map out the march, we have to keep in mind there are going to be these big chunks of time, not just, hey, let's linger here for a while. Right. No, 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 no. There's going to be extended periods of time to beget children and allow them to grow. Then we're going to set off again. OK. All right. So he's worked that out. So he's got he's now has this number in his head. One hundred and thirty years. One hundred and thirty low R. Um, is our minimum rest period when it's time for the making of children. Okay, fine, fine. Um, notice he's ballparking the number of the Quendi here. The total number of Quendi is about 15,000. Notice he's supposing, right? Again, he's, 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 uh, uh, he's, he's roughing it here. He's roughing it out. What matters here is the, are the proportions Rather, he's not calculated these numbers. We're going to get to the calculations. He's not calculated these numbers. Um, he's just doing narrative with these numbers, right? Um, notice the narrative. Notice the stories that are being contained here. Story number one. Those who obey, who answer the call of the Valar outnumber the Avari two to one. That's story number one that one-third of the elves decide to remain behind. Okay. Super obscure Bible trivia time. Why? Anybody get the biblical reference? There's a biblical reference here. Bonus points if you get this one. It's super obscure. It's kind of... Bible reference slash Catholic tradition built upon super obscure Bible passages. Anybody know why he said 5,000 of Ari remained behind out of the 15,000? It's 
a tough one. It's a tough one. Answer. Because everybody knows. In the Middle Ages, everybody knew um, that the number of angels that fell with Lucifer was one third of the total. One third of the total angels fell. This is based, by the way, on the passage in Revelation when the dragon, uh, like with his tail, makes one third of the stars fall out of heaven. Um, and this, uh, the commentary tradition that was built upon that verse, uh, said that the, the, the dragon is Satan. Like that's a not a big interpretive leap. Um, and, uh, and that one-third, uh, he takes one-thirds of the stars with him. So it says that one-third of the angels, the original angels, fell and became demons with Satan. Um, and that is the pattern that he seems to have adopted here. That of the original Eldar, one-third refused the call and remained behind. And two-thirds went along with him. Now, um, did... Uh, uh, it, does that mean, you know, is he suggesting some kind of identity or connection, you know, close connection between the Avari and demons? No, no, he's not saying the Avari became evil. I, but um, but it doesn't shock me at all that when he posed to himself the question, what mathematical proportion of the elves stayed behind and didn't answer the call, that he thought one third is no surprise to me at all because it fits the general shape uh, of those things. Um, uh, so, um, yeah. Exa yeah, they uh, they defected with Satan. Uh, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right, Jocelyn. Um, that's the, that's the idea. Um, okay. So that's story number one, that two-thirds of the elves went on the march. Story number two, the proportions of that 10,000. How did that 10,000 break down? Right? How did that 10,000 break down? 1,000 were Vanyar slash Ingar. 3,500 were Noldor. And 5,500 were Teleri. Now, we always knew from the oldest stories that the Teleri were the most numerous, right? But we're done with vaguenesses like that. It is time for numbers. It is it is the age of mathematics in the history of Middle Earth, right? Um, so we have the exact numbers and a precise proportion. So what does this mean? This means that more than 50%, 55% to be exact, of the elves who followed were Teleri, right? They were not just the largest of the three factions. They were the majority of all of the elves that came with them, right? And on the other end, we have the Vanyar, the Ingar, who are 10%. They are a tithe of the elves, which also strikes me uh, as a uh, more vaguely, but still a vaguely uh, sort of biblical concept. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that they should be one-tenth. Note how this makes the Ingar from the beginning this um, sort of special minority, right? This tithe uh, of them. Um, like 10% of the original, which were set aside, uh, right, for the, um, um, uh, you know, for the special reverence of Manwe and Varda, right, eventually. Um Exactly what I'm thinking, JJ. They were kind of like the uh, like the elvish Levites. Yeah. Now that's not one tenth. That's one tribe, right? So um, it would that was one twelfth, which is a more elvish number, to be perfectly frank, right? It almost makes me surprised that he's thinking in such round numbers here. But again, notice he's not yet doing the full detailed world building. This is just approximates, right? These are numbers he's tossing off, clearly. Just just, just throwing down some numbers and trying to see what it would look like, right? Similarly, here he is eyeballing the distances in Beleriand. What's the difference between his planning of the march here and his planning of the march, say, in the Book of Lost Tales? He's got a map. He's got a map. He's got a map with a scale, right? With a, with a mile scale built straight into it. He can measure the distance from the mountains of Loon 
to the Sea of Hrun, right? Um, he knows that distance. He doesn't have to guess. 1,200 miles, over 1,200 miles. Now, he does have to eyeball Beleriand a little bit, 550 miles from Eglarest to the Mountains of Loon, right? So from the Blue Mountains to Eglarest, 550 miles. He's got a map for that, too. But um, it's a little less precise than the, map, the Lord of the Rings map. Um, but then he's got to do some guesswork. How far east or southeast of the Sea of Hrun was Quivienen? Yeah, 250 miles-ish, apparently, right? Uh, is his uh, is his is his guess? Um, okay. Um, Tomas, that's a really interesting point. That's a really interesting point. Tomas says there is no real racial difference between the three groups of Quendi. They're just divided by which group followed whom. Yes, I think. Something like that. Uh, Tomas, I would add the, um, the changing of their name from the Vanyard to the Ingar tracks with that, doesn't it? That he is wanting to identify them more closely with their leader, with the dude that they choose to follow. So what makes these Thousand Elves special is not that they're some special subfamily of the Elves, but that they are the Elves who followed Ingwe. Maybe. Maybe. Um, that's a really interesting idea. And I wonder, I wonder if, uh, I mean, we don't know exactly why he changed the name to Ingar, but, um, uh, but that's an interesting theory. All right, but... We're not going to be content just to eyeball it like this for that long, right? Let's work it out. Now, Chad, I'm not going to go through all the math. So I'm apologizing to Chad Bornholt in advance. <laughs> because, uh, so, and I, but let me say, Chad was pointing out, Chad did go through the math very carefully, the generation math, you know, when Tolkien was calculating. Um, uh, when you've got the the 24 original elves who wake up and they start immediately with the begetting business, right? They go, they immediately go into the begetting business. And then we've got like the, right. How old would they be? He, he, he works it out with great care, right? How old will they be? And then they'll have the second child. And then the second generation will, and like the first generation, like will be, will go, go until this long. And then the, the other ones will have started growing up and they'll be starting to have kids. And so he's really working it out. Um, Indeed, based upon so notice what notice what it is, right? What has happened here is he has taken the world building he's done. He's made decisions about elvish culture, right? How they operate physiologically, culturally, right? And he's now saying, let's apply that. Given that, how would it work? How fast could they multiply? How fast could we get from twenty four to a reasonable population? And is there enough time in that ten thousand years? Right. Okay. Um, so he does. The, he he works it out. Now Chad emailed me a while back. And he says he can show everyone at Texmoot. That's right. Come to Texmoot this year in February, in early February, down in Austin, Texas, and Chad will definitely show you his spreadsheet uh, for how he worked this out. Um, I, I will give Chad credit for this. What he noticed was that Tolkien made an error. Chad, if I'm recalling correctly, in the sixth generation, um, that basically. Tolkien basically he kind of like slipped one of his terms like he 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 counted as if he he basically compressed that um exactly uh Chad said in order for the math to work at that point every sixth child would have had to have sex tuplets um in other words he didn't leave the sufficient time for like the width of that generation the amount of time it would take all the children to be born uh in that generation um so it doesn't that his math, Tolkien's math, is not quite correct. I'm not deeply troubled uh, by this, deeply bothered by it. That is, um, I can't help but think when I read through that whole section that I would have done a much worse job <laughs> than Tolkien. I probably would have made more errors than this. Um, to me, the most important thing is the fact that he is working this out, right? Um, and notice, to me, this has two different... Um, 
impact. Uh, there are several conclusions that I draw from the fact that Tolkien does that math. Um, right, <laughs> Chad does admit that he did have Excel doing the math for him, right? So having discovered the magic of spreadsheets, uh, he had an advantage over Tolkien in that way. Exactly. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, a few observations I make about the fact that he does that math. First of all, um, he, I've talked about him not being content anymore just to wave his hands and say things like, they had grown to become a great people, right? N no, he's not going to say, how great exactly? And is it possible? Does it work? Um, his standards for maintaining the inner consistency of reality, super high these days, isn't it? Right? He's way, way up there. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, he's, um, uh, that's, one thing that we can conclude. Another thing that we can conclude is that Tolkien, by doing this, is in essence playtesting the world building that he had done before. He had described how Elvish culture worked. Um, is it practical? Does it actually work out? That's the second thing that we see. And his answer is, yeah. Yeah. It does work, more or less, right? With a few mistakes along the way. Um, but it does work. It does work. Um, and so, therefore, I think that seems to me uh, that it it's like an affirmation. If it didn't work, he'd have had to go back and make some adjustments to the world building. Somewhere along the way, something would have had to give, right? But it's all, it's all kind of going together. And then there's the third thing. What does it do to the stories? What kind of impact does it have on the stories? Now... Um, let's, um, uh, yeah, Gerald, exactly. Tolkien did need a spreadsheet. Totally, totally agree. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, now the chart, he makes this chart, right? And I love this chart. I just love it. I love everything about this chart. Um, this chart chart just makes my own heart sing, uh, I, I have to admit, because I love this kind of attention to detail. Um, I love seeing this in place. And what I'm loving about this most, you might think it is, I could um, easily understand if somebody said, okay, you know what, this is all kind of cool, but talk about killing the magic. You know, I mean, like, I liked the mythic vagueness of the Silmarillion, and I don't really want to know exactly, like, how many miles did they make on the Great March in a single marching season? Like, I don't need to know that. I just, I want to stick with the big mythic story. I can totally understand somebody who thinks that way, and I would think nonetheless of anyone who did. However, I found in reading through this section, watching him work out all of these details and begin in this big fat central column um, to flesh out the narrative in intimate detail, right? Not content with just saying, and then by then they had become a great people and then they set out on the march and the march was long and some decided to tarry along the way, but eventually they reached Beleriand, right? Instead, instead of telling it that way, he wants to know. He want, Tolkien's curiosity here I find charming. He, he wants to see what it looked like. But there's more than that. When he does, it is enriched. The story itself becomes enriched. And part of the reason that it becomes enriched, and this was the part that I just found an absolute delight, was that it becomes enriched because it is coming into contact with the Lord of the Rings. So let's look at how this goes. Um, it's going to look for the next few slides like I'm going to go through this entire chart paragraph by paragraph. It is not so. I'm only going to go through about half of it that way. <laughs> but I loved every bit of it. We're going to worrying about the first half of this, and then I'm going to skip some bits. Okay. So he has three columns, the first column of which is he labels generation, year, and progress toward the sea. So this is just kind of keeping track of all three of those things. Which generation of elves is, is uh, you know, uh, the, 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 most, the recent one that we're working on, right? 
in what year is this happening and how much progress have they made on the Great March. And then the third column on the right hand side is the pot, the total is keeping track of a running total of the population of the marchers. And then in the middle, we have the big fat narrative column, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so the first section is starts in the eighth generation at Valley in year 1129.29. That is the 29th sun year within the Valley in year 1129. Also called uh, the year of awakening, 18,605. So it's been 18,605 years since the awakening of the elves at Quivianen. Years of the sun, that is, since the awakening of the elves at Quivianen. And by the end of this year, they uh, have gone 450 miles. And the population of the marchers is 20,000, as he's going to say at the beginning. So the march begins in Valian year 1129, Loa 29. The great host of 20,000 goes very slowly, 2,000 miles to go. It has to provide food, clothing, etc. en route, though it had the help of the Valar via Orame. It proceeds mainly in the late spring to early autumn, April to September. The general process is to make a period of marching and then to halt for repairs, cloth making, or, f or fur curing, and the rest. Wait, and rest. The march began about April 1st of Loa 29, a valley in year 1129, thus well provided to start. It goes about 200 miles by the end of April, halts, then goes on again from June 20th to July 20th, with 200 more miles, total 400. It is now near the east side of the Sea of Rhun, then a very pleasant place. After some debate, it moves to the shores of the Sea of Rhun, total 450 miles and there stops during the rest of Loa 29, and does not move on again, because many are for the time being content and desire to beget children. Okay. Um, this, uh, isn't this fun? See how he's, how he's imagining this? See the kinds of questions he's asking, which he never once asked in the whole length and breadth of the Silmarillion, right? When they're marching, won't they have to make repairs to things? And, like, make new clothes and stuff? They're totally going to want to do that, aren't they? So we need to work that in to the schedule. So we can't... So, again, you notice, like, the total lack of hand-waving. He's committed. He is committed to imagining how this... What this would really have looked like, right? Um, you know, one of the... One of the ways I would kind of paraphrase his new approach to this, you know, the new Silmarillion that he's working on now is, but what really happened, right? What did it really look like? Notice the level of detail that he is getting down to here, right? Um, down to the dates. Month of April. They made 200 miles in April. Pretty good time, right? But not ridiculous. 30 days. 200 miles, right? So they're going, um, what are they going? Like uh, six miles a day-ish, right? Between six and seven miles a day on average. Yeah, that's not bad. And remember, these are like old time elves, right? Um, whose Hroa are still, uh, you know, uh, all full of uh, vim and such. And 20,000 marchers is a pretty big crowd. Uh, but anyway, they can they can do it. So they, they keep on that way, and then they, they stop for a month and a half, right? Take a good six weeks off. Time to uh, cure some furs and uh, make some cloth. Right? We got we to gotta, we gotta, we gotta get our, uh, you know, looms off the wagons and assemble them and do some light weaving for the next six weeks and such, right? You know, I mean, we got some, we got some, we, we got some work to do here. Um, even though they were well provisioned and they got to provide food. Oh man, right? They're busy. Okay. So um, then they're going to stop at the end. So after going on, you know, halting, they get to the Sea of Rune, which is then a very pleasant place. Um, 
you f- do you feel the weight of the word then? It is now near the east side of the Sea of Hrun, then a very pleasant place. Then, as opposed to in the Third Age, under the domination of Sauron, right? Uh, at that point, the area around the Sea of Hrun was a significantly less popular vacation spot, right? Given the proximity of the Sea of Rune to Mordor, right? But that word then reminds us as readers and definitely shows that Tolkien was thinking about the Lord of the Rings, right? Um, but notice the other thing, the other impact there. The elves have now wandered onto the Lord of the Rings map. They are now officially in familiar territory. Now, the area to the east of the Sea of Rune is not particularly familiar to us, right? None of the story takes place there and everything, but but it's on the map. We know just where it is, and we know just where they are now in relationship to everything else. But it's time to stop and beget another generation of children here by the Sea of Hrun. Um Next. The ninth generation begins. Valiant year 1129 slash 39. So it's been 10 years. In other words, gestation period, right? Of the available, uh, and, and, and the population of marchers has now increased to 2,000, right? Or 22,000, sorry. Of the available 4,500 eighth generation pairs, 2,000 beget children in the spring of Loa 30. Note, by the way, also, um, he's playtesting again, right? He did all that math, all that, all those calculations about how long it takes for each generation to do and what the total numbers would be, right? Now he's going to continue. Uh, he's going to continue to apply it, right, and see if it works. He's going to bring it into touch with the narrative and see how it flies, right? Okay, 2,000 of them beget children in the spring of Loa 30. So remember, it was through the fall of 29 that they stopped at this, when they stopped at the Sea of Rune. So the next spring, we've got 2,000 begettings happening, right? Um, notice, by the way, another piece of, another mathematical story that he's told there? Do you see it? Of the available 4,500 eighth generation pairs, 2,000 beget children in the spring of Loa 30. Fewer than half of the, of the elves who might have procreated um, there by the Sea of Rune actually did. So that's interesting, right? There, that's still, um, that's still a, a whole bunch of begetting going on, right? There's there's still a substantial quantity of procreation underway here. Um, but can I just say, uh, it's really hard uh, to um, be mature and not make uh, childish jokes at this point. And can I also say that I seem to be doing better at that than some people in the chat? <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing you guys. Okay, so they, the two, so <laughs> anyway, um, but fewer than half of them do. So more than half of the procreation qualifying elves choose to procreate at this point, which is interesting, isn't it? Okay, they, the 2,000 children, thus begotten, are born in the spring of Loa 39, because of course it takes, so we've had the nine years gestation period. The host, therefore, does not move again for 10 growth years more equals 20 lower. Remember, we already had the 130 lower calculation that he did before, he's applying it now, right? So we've got 120 lower, we've got to hang out here, right? Valian year, so that equals Valian year uh, 1129 slash 
159. So if you you started at 39 and you add 120, it equals 159, except wait, that's over 144. So carry the 15 equals Valiant year 1130, 15. So it's now the 15th low R of Valiant year 130. So it's the entire next Valiant year until they take off. It is now combined with 2,000 young children of about uh, growth year 11, right? So they're now about 11 years old in growth years. Okay, fine. Cool. Now we're up to 22,000. But wait, there's more. Valiant year 1130, 15, which is the year, right, that we were just talking about, the year that they're now ready to set out. 650 miles. So wait, hang on a second. Where were we before? We were at 450 miles. Okay, so we got 200 miles to go. In spring and summer of Valiant year 113015, it only moves 200 miles, 650 total. It camps in what are the wide grasslands before Mirkwood is reached, and full of grain and food. The elves taught by Orame sow grain that autumn and reap in the summer of 113016. They do this three times, till 113019, and do not move on till spring 113020. Okay, so they pause. So again, one thing, notice again, touching base with the Lord of the Rings, right? We can picture this now. We can picture this exactly. They are just east of Mirkwood, which, mind, doesn't have that big east bite cut out of it anymore, or yet, rather. You know that big, uh, the, there's a big dent in the uh, southern half of the eastern side of Mirkwood called the East Bight, right? B-I-G-H-T, um, which Tolkien says is um, a, that's a, that's from the time when the, um, when the, when Rovanian was around, right? The human kingdom of Rovanian was responsible for felling the, um, uh, felling the trees there and creating the East Bight, right? Um, so, um, that's not there yet. But we've got the grasslands there to the east of Mirkwood. So we have all these associations, not with that grassland specifically, but with Mirkwood, we sure do, right? That's a very familiar place to us. And it turns out that the grasslands are full of grain and food. So Orame says, why don't we take a little break and have a snack? By which I mean three years of agriculture, <laughs> right? So for elves... They're, they're, this is this is a light farming break, right? Okay, light farming break for the elves, and they spend three sowing and reaping seasons. Now they've got all kinds of food stores. Oh, this is great. So now in the spring of 113020, notice how they, again, how Tolkien is mapping it year by year, every year. He's not waving his hands at anything. He's not skipping anything, right? He's got every step, every year of the march worked out. Exactly where are they on the map? What are they up to? And how long do they take doing it, right? This is, uh, this is awesome. But wait, it gets even better. Okay, what do they do then in 113020? That year, they reach the Great Forest that is Mirkwood, another 200 miles. This looks a lovely place, but they find it contains lurking evils. Possibly Sauron is aware of the march? Anyway, many of Melkor's evils are abroad. They retire back into the grasslands 50 miles. So 850 minus 50 equals 800. So they went 850 miles and then they backtracked 50. And await help from Orame. Orame comes in 1130.25 and drives off the evils and encourages the Eldar. Um, so, okay. First of all, um, Valiant time, right? Orame was like, okay, I'll be back in five minutes, and he comes back five years later. Five years of the sun later, right? Meanwhile, they've just, they're like, it's okay, we like these planes. Let's do some more farming. Anybody want to farm some more? That was fun. Let's farm some more, right? So there they are farming for five years, because in 1130-20, they, um, they ran into Mirkwood and found that it was sketchy, right? Sketchy from the start is Mirkwood. There was literally never a time when Mirkwood wasn't dangerous. The crossing of Mirkwood is fraught with peril from the oldest 
oldest days. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that kind of fun? Right? So, you know, Thranduil and his people might reminisce about Greenwood the Great and getting back to the days when, uh, you know, uh, it was still merry under the trees in the Greenwood, right? But um, they're fooling themselves, right? It was always sketchy. When they first met it, they were sketchy. Um, Jen wants to know if there were spiders. Well, probably, probably were. Maybe were. I don't know if they were or not. The question is, I mean, we know Ungoliant is not yet around, so probably not, as the spiders of Mirkwood are the descendants of Shelob, who is the daughter of Ungoliant, and Ungoliant is still lurking and is still starving in a cave over on the other side of the ocean. So, no. Um, not spiders, apparently. But um, still, uh, still evils. Still evils there. Um, so yeah, so five years, Arthur, is how long they spent um, waiting for Daddy Orame to show up and uh, beat off the evils. But you notice another thing there? Notice the impact that the answering of the call is already having on the elves. Um, isn't it possible that um, confronting the evils in Middle-earth and setting things to rights healing Middle Earth was like kind of part of their jobs, the Eldar. And yet here we see them deferring, right? Huh. Pretty scary in that forest. It's lovely, right? Lovely trees, except evil stuff in there. So, um, how about we just go back and do some more farming until Orame comes back and takes care of it all for us? Then we can go. Maybe. Right? Um, I'm not saying that he is necessarily suggesting the elves have already been weakened by the Great March, by the choice, by the meddling of the Valar, um, but it seems at least possible that that's the case. Now in 26, so it's now six years after the original discovery of Mirkwood and turning back from it, the Ingar and the Noldor, following Nahar, pass through the great forest, rich in fruit and berries, at its southern end, which was farther south than in the Third Age, during 1130-26. They come out into the Anduin Vale and are delighted with it. Their chieftains cannot get them to proceed further at that time. Their general thought is, why not dwell here and let the Valar guard us? This is where Quendi should dwell, between wood and water. Only the chiefs who had seen Amon are not content. The Lindar here begin to straggle. Not all had reached the east side of the forest when the Ingar and Noldor went through. None have yet followed Orame. Um... So, Kendall, exactly. They do end up deciding to build a summer home here. That's precisely what we see. So notice two things. First, we now know the exact place where the Teleri begin to fall behind the rest of the host, right? The host of Anoldor and the uh, Vanyar slash Ingar, and that is Mirkwood. Mirkwood is the place. Mirkwood is this first obstacle that the, the Teleri held back from um, and were straggling along behind. But notice now an enrichment of the story. And those of you who have followed along in our History of Middle-Earth series will recognize that when Tolkien is doing um, like narrative, like outlines and projections like this, and he starts slipping into dialogue, beware because the novel is starting to happen now, <laughs> right? I, I, keep, I kept expecting these central columns of these charts uh, to, like, stretch to, you know, like 14 pages or something like that. Um, but 
But notice the other thing that we get. Notice the other thing that we get in this story that we didn't get in the Book of Lost Tales or the published Silmarillion or anywhere else. The drama of the Ingar and the Noldor themselves. We have, it's not the Teleri who are settling down in the Anduin Vale and saying, let's stay here. This is perfect. Why go any further? It's the Ingar and the Noldor themselves. And we see that all of the elves, even the Ingar, who are the most dedicated of all of them, right? Even they are saying, this is where Quendi should dwell, between wood and water. They're like, we love it here. We love it here. But this is where Quendi should dwell. Doesn't it feel like he's still leaning into this, the Valar are wrong thing, right? I mean, there is all kinds of reasons for him to, him meaning Orome, sorry, for the Valar, right, to see this is not what's supposed to happen. Why are you dragging them away from this place where they are saying this is where Quendi should dwell? That's what their hearts are telling them. And they found this wonderful place. They're like, hey, thanks for taking on the, us on this long walk. Really, it's been great, right? But um, this is where we should dwell, between wood and water. And then there's that other thing. Like I was just saying before about the weakness, right? Why not dwell here and let the Valar guard us, right? Yeah. So if you guys want to take care of us, that's great, and we appreciate it. And there were some scary evil things in the forest, which might have been, but probably weren't spiders. So therefore, um, great idea. We, we, we have a great idea. Why don't you come and guard us here? Instead of taking us all the way to your house, let's just stay here, and then you can, you know, look out for us, and then everything's perfect, right? So they're still kind of not doing things for themselves, but at least they have this impulse to settle here. Only the chiefs who had seen Amon were not content. And notice that even that seems to me to have two edges, doesn't it? That is, the discontent of the chieftains, that is, the ambassadors who have been to Valinor, they are discontented here. They only are discontented. What does that say? Yes, it speaks to the ignorance of the others. They don't know what they're turning away from. They've not seen Valinor, right? And so if they had, they would they would think that was where elves really belonged, right? So to some extent, their declaration that this is where Quendi should dwell is mere ignorance on their part. But on the other hand, isn't it possible that it rather works the other way? If the Valor, if the invitation of the Valor is a bad idea, isn't it a little conspicuous that the result of taking the ambassadors to Valinor is discontent? Now, having been to Valinor, they are discontented with the world into which they were born. Is that a good thing? In some ways, it might be a good thing. It's a little bit of a good thing. Perhaps. But it also seems like it could very well be a bad thing. Discontent is not a great look, actually. And they're not just in the minority. They're alone. It is only they who are discontented here. Everyone else, including all... Well, I was going to say 999 of the Ingar, but that number's out the window. Um, but, um... Yeah, yeah. Um... But then there's more, isn't there? And there's again that overlay that we are receiving onto the map that we know. Because now we're into places that we do know. Where are they? Where are they? Not far from Lothlorien, right? They're not far from Lothlorien. From exactly Kendall the heart of Elvendom on Earth, as it will be called later on by somebody or other, right? Yeah, that's about where they are. 
Um, notice how this, as I said, it overlays an entirely new dimension over the story of the Lord of the Rings. Isn't that cool? Isn't that fun? Oh, and wait. Where else are they near? They're also near that place which in later days will be called Dol Guldur, right? And so we have the notion, which is already emerging in some of the Unfinished Tales material, that the site of Dol Guldur, the hill upon which Sauron's later stronghold will be built, was an old home of the elves. Um, The Ingar and Noldor settle on the east bank of the Anduin, the region of later Lorien. They rest till spring 113027. Then a new begetting of children begins. Available pairs of the Ingar and Noldor are about 4,000. The total eighth generation equals 14,000, but one third are Avari, leaving about 9,000 Eldar, uh, 9 slash uh, uh, 20 of which equals 450 times 9 equals 4,050 4, available pairs. 2,000 pairs beget children. 1,000 for the first time, 1,000 for the second time. So notice again, fewer than one half of the total eligible procreators choose to procreate. Um, so there are 2,000 children born in the spring of 1130 to 36. The Eldar like their life there. The presence of the Maiar drives off evil, and the place is rich in flowers and food. In spite of the chiefs, they are unwilling to move. In spite of the chiefs, they are unwilling to move. And, ooh, Bricktails, you're completely right about that. Hang on a second, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, yes, you're right, Amon Lunk is the name of the hill upon which Dol Guldur was eventually built. Yes, you are right. Um, notice... Their plan is working. The Valar can keep the evil off. And what have they done? Yep. They've sent a whole bunch of Maiar. Don't ask me why it's spelled M-A-Y-A-R here. It just is. It just is. Roll with it. I never t question Tolkien's languages. Whenever Tolkien starts tweaking his languages and his naming and stuff, my job is just to track with it and let it go. That's my approach. Anyway. Um, yeah, so the Maiar, they send a bunch of Maiar come who drive off the evil. So yeah, Operation Protect Our New Homeland is in place, right? No problem. This is great. And so there they are explicitly, the Ingar and the Noldor having settled in the region of later Lorien. Explicitly. So here we are. This, the next generation, the ninth generation of the uh, Noldor and Ingar are begotten in Lorien. And again, think of the overlay. Why did Galadriel want to settle there, of all places? Either by chance... Machinations of Sauron, and or because Orome withdraws protection, hoping to make the Eldar less content with their new home, um, at Yamar, it's called, winters are hard and the weather worsens. The host is now burdened with many young, born between 1129-39 and 1130-89. That is the two begettings we've had so far. The oldest of those, uh, that in 1131-65 will be Valiant year 2 or 26 years old, equal 304, 14 lower. The youngest are about 10 growth years. So the oldest ones are now 314 years of the sun. The other are about 120 years of the sun. The total of these is 8,000 in the total host of 28,000. So there's now 8,000 kids. Well, the older ones are now young adults, right? Uh, practically ready to start procreating themselves. Um, but the other ones... Anyway, there's a, there's a whole bunch of youngsters about. Um, and notice the contrivance of Orome. 
Let's withdraw the protection and let the evil things attack them, and then maybe they'll be ready to go on. This sound like a good plan to you? I don't know, Orame. I'm getting a red flag here. The chiefs order an advance across the Anduin for spring 113091. The Teleri already show a love of water in boats and begin a great boat building. They are ready with rafts and boats in the course of 113090, but a large part of the Teleri later fought this, and in the winter of 113091, that's when they are fighting it. The Anduin is wild and flooded, with, and great snowstorms fall in the misty mountains, then much taller, which last far into the spring. The total Telerian host is 13,000 now. More than 3,000 refuse to leave Atyamar, that is like the uh, 